being born, growing old, death and rebirth. This relentless cycle of experience and suffering is what the Buddha sought to find a solution for. To do this, he left his life of luxury, the life of a prince, and went out into the world, traveling, meditating and undertaking great hardship, and finally gaining enlightenment under the cool shades of a Bodhi tree. The Buddha began the life of a teacher and a master with his first discourse in Sarnath. People were so moved by his words that they came in large numbers to listen to him and many of them became monks in the order. And with this, the first Buddhist Sangha was formed. Often the Buddha was asked how a person could ensure a good birth so that his quest for knowledge can continue without a break. The Buddha said that those who seek with conviction should visit Lumbini, the place of his birth, Bodhgaya, where he got enlightenment, Sarnath, the place of his first discourse, and Kushinagar, the place where he attained Parinirvana. So, the practice of visiting the holy sites became a tradition and many who stayed in the monasteries nearby have gained enlightenment. Let us walk with the master. Queen Maya Devi, the wife of the Sakya king Suddhodana, was travelling through the forest to her father's kingdom to give birth to her first child. As she reached the beautiful Lumbini Gardens, she felt that the birth of the prince was about to happen. She took a bath in the Pushkarini tank and prepared herself for the birth of the child. Walking a short distance from the tank, Maya Devi grabbed hold of the branch of a tree and gave birth to the child. The child prince was to be named Siddhartha, who later became the Buddha. Walking around the garden, we see the tree where Maya Devi first felt her labor pains. The garden is decorated with colorful flags that flutter in the wind. It is believed that the prayers of the pilgrims who tie the flags will be carried by the wind to heaven. The child was given his first bath in the Pushkarini tank and then the queen with all her attendants returned to Kapilavastu, the capital of the Sakya kingdom. This garden was lost in the pages of history for a thousand years. The efforts of a German archaeologist and the meticulous records kept by the Chinese pilgrim Fazian helped in the rediscovery of the site. Excavating the site further, the archaeologist found the nativity statue. The statue showing the story of the birth of Siddhartha was made by artisans from Mathura in India and stands overlooking the spot of his birth. The Chinese pilgrim Fa Zian had written that the spot of the birth of Siddhartha was 25 steps from the Pushkarani tank and marked by Ashoka with a stone plaque. But the Maya Devi temple ruins covered the spot. The authorities were left in a dilemma. 
where do we dig? To locate the spot, they came up with a unique idea. They needed to find out the length of the Fazian shrine and measure 25 steps towards the temple. They did just that. And digging several feet into the ground, the marker left by Ashoka was there. The exact spot where Siddhartha touched the earth was found. Now covered in a bulletproof case, the plaque is there for all to see. King Ashoka, who became a follower of the Buddha, visited the garden and built many structures that we see today. Look up and you will see the eyes of Buddha painted on the golden pinnacle. The eyes of Buddha keep watch in all four directions. As we move around, we come across the old monastery. Here, there are many small stupas. These stupas were built encasing the ashes of monks who attained enlightenment at Lumbini. The famous Ashoka pillar bears an inscription that says, King Piyadasi, beloved of Devas, in the 20th year of his coronation, made a royal visit to Lumbini. Buddha, Sakyamuni, having been born here, a stone railing was built and a stone pillar erected at the site of his birth. The child prince was taken to Kapilavastu, capital of the Sakya kingdom, and the child prince is named Siddhartha. The child's father, Shuddhodana, is the Sakya king, chief of one of the many tribes of the Koshala kingdom. Seven days after the birth of Siddhartha, Queen Maya Devi, unable to recover from the childbirth, passed away. The motherless child was now left in the care of Pajapati Gotami, who is Maya Devi's younger sister and also another wife of King Shuddhodana. Gotami took care of Siddhartha like her own child. The great sage Asita heard of the birth of the child and visited the palace. Shuddhodana eagerly took the sage to see his son. The sage studied the child and told Shuddhodana that Siddhartha was destined to be a great teacher. He blessed the child and parents and returned to the forest. As Siddhartha grew up, he studied under the best teachers in the land. Soon, he had learnt all that they could teach and surpassed them in knowledge. King Shuddhodana showered Siddhartha with all the pleasures that royal life could offer. The words of Sage Asita kept coming back to the king and Shuddhodana was worried that Siddhartha may one day leave the palace and take up the life of an ascetic. Shuddhodana approached his counsellors who advised him that the prince should be married. The responsibility of a family would make him more interested in the activity of the kingdom. When Siddhartha became 16 years old, his father arranged his marriage to a beautiful young cousin of the same age. She was the daughter of a Sakya chieftain named Suprabuddha and her name was Yashodhara. Their life together was immensely satisfying and Siddhartha spent much of his time in the company of his wife. Some years later, Yashodhara gave birth to their son, whom they named Rahula. During the 29 years that Siddhartha spent as a prince in Kapilavastu, there was nothing that he lacked. His father ensured that Siddhartha had everything he wanted. And yet, there were dark moments when the young prince suffered the pain of uncertainty and despair. Siddhartha's despair was born of a spiritual restlessness coiled deep within him. Unknown to himself, the seed of a different future was growing. 
Though King Shuddhodana tried his best to shield his son from the pains and processes of ordinary life and kept him within the protection of luxury, soon enough, the inevitable happened. One day, as he was riding out from the palace in his chariot, watching the bustle and commerce of ordinary city life, Siddhartha was struck by the forbidden sight of an old and decrepit man. It was a disturbing sight. The young prince returned to his palace, lost in thought. It showed him for the first time the insecurity of living and the decay that was an inalienable part of every human life. Another day, riding in the company of his trusted charioteer, Channa, he saw a man on the road ridden with disease and pain and came away with the realization that suffering was embedded in the life of man. The third sight was that of death. Seeing a corpse laid out on a bier, the prince was so shaken by the transience of life that he lapsed into deep thought, wondering how one could liberate oneself from the experience of death. This time Siddhartha could not be consoled. He became very quiet and pondered how he could find a way of helping the world from the cycle of birth, growing old and death. He explained that he was not against beautiful objects and music or dance. What worried him was that all this was temporary and he had lost interest in them. He wanted to find out what was a more permanent form of happiness and a way out of suffering. King Shuddhodana was totally distressed. He was now certain he would not be able to stop the inevitable. He was sure that his son would soon leave the palace to live a lonely life of a monk in search of the truth. And then, not long afterwards, came the fourth and final sight that appeared like an answer to these problems. The young prince caught sight of a meditating monk, serene and alienated from the despair of life. Here was someone who had renounced worldly pleasures and was living as an ascetic. Siddhartha realized that he had found an answer. He resolved to leave the palace and undertake the long journey to find the true path to happiness. As Siddhartha entered the palace, his father could see that his greatest fears had come true. He had lost his son to the life of a monk. Shuddhodana tried to reason with his son to give up the thought. Siddhartha replied, Father, I will stay if you can promise that I shall never grow old, never become ill, never die and never be unhappy. Shuddhodana was shocked and helpless. In the middle of the night, Siddhartha left his wife and son sleeping in the bed and walked out of the palace. He looked at his wife and son and longed to hold his son one last time. Fearing that he would wake up Yashodhara and then it be impossible to leave, he quietly left the palace. He ordered Channa to saddle his horse and they both silently rode away into the forest. When Siddhartha had reached the river bordering the kingdom, he dismounted and told Channa that he would not be returning to the palace. He told him his journey had just begun. As Channa realized what was happening, he broke down and wept. He tried his best to convince Siddhartha to return to the palace. Siddhartha was determined and he consoled Channa and sent him back to Kapilavastu. Siddhartha started his long journey towards enlightenment at Rajgir. Soon after leaving his sheltered life in the palace, he found himself alone in the forest. 
Standing in the darkness of the night, Siddhartha wanted to complete the transformation of the prince to a simple monk. He pulled out his knife and cut his long flowing hair. The long hair was a sign of royalty. Next, Siddhartha met a hunter going home from the forest. He offered him his royal clothes in exchange for his rustic clothes. The hunter happily agreed. Siddhartha now slowly walked into the forest and sat under a mango tree. He contemplated on how he should proceed on his task of finding an answer to end all suffering. His first thought was to find a guru, someone who could put him on the path and teach him the techniques of meditation. With this thought in mind, Siddhartha proceeded to Rajgir. Here, he met two sages experienced in the art of meditation. They were Allara Kalama and Uddaka Ramaputta. The sages were experienced and had knowledge in various aspects of meditation. Siddhartha stayed with them many months. He learnt and practiced all that they could teach. On a hill called Gridhakuta or Vulture's Peak, Siddhartha began his quest for enlightenment. The peak overlooks a beautiful valley. With the sounds of the birds and cool winds blowing over him, Siddhartha must have become one with nature. Siddhartha soon realized that his teachers lacked the true knowledge he required to achieve enlightenment. He decided to move on and continue his quest elsewhere. Moving away from Rajgir, Siddhartha traveled further and reached the forest near Uruvela on the banks of the Niranjana river. Here at Uruvela, Siddhartha met five monks who are also practicing austerities in search of the truth. Siddhartha joined up with these monks and continued his search. The five monks introduced Siddhartha to the practice of total mortification of the body. This path demanded that the seeker should keep all his senses in check and practice severe austerities. Siddhartha was impressed by the efforts of the five monks and entered the practice with great resolve. Being impressed by Siddhartha's efforts, the five monks soon began to look at Siddhartha as their master. Siddhartha kept increasing the intensity of the austerities. For six long years, he lived in the hollow of a boulder on top of the Pragbodhi hill. At the end of six years, Siddhartha was existing only on hemp grain for his sustenance. His once handsome body was reduced to skin and bone. His shrunken body was like a withered branch of a tree. Siddhartha felt that all his efforts were not moving him closer to his goal. He slowly realized that this was not the path to enlightenment. He decided to abandon this path. Siddhartha realized he had to adopt a middle path, somewhere between extreme austerities and extreme indulgence. He crossed the Niranjana River and reached a spot under a Bodhi tree. Here, under this tree, he made a seat of grass and sat in its cool shade. Siddhartha began to meditate and told himself, Here on this seat, my body may shrivel up, my skin, my bones, my flesh may dissolve, but my body will not move from the seat until I have attained enlightenment. It was a full moon day in May, and the sun was about to set in the western sky. As Siddhartha slowly passed into deep meditation, there arose a force who was determined to disturb him and make him fail. The forces of Mara, the incarnation of greed, hatred, ignorance, jealousy and doubt. Mara just could not afford to have Siddhartha attain enlightenment. Siddhartha would teach the world the way out of suffering and Mara would be destroyed. 
Mara mounted all his forces and magical powers to confront Siddhartha. The grove around the Bodhi tree shook with lightning, thunder and rain. But under the Bodhi tree, Siddhartha was left untouched by the sheer powers he had gained from his meditation. Mara's weapons were useless and they fell at Siddhartha's feet as petals of roses. At last, Mara confronted Siddhartha. He demanded why Siddhartha should be allowed to achieve what countless others had failed to learn. Siddhartha lifted his right hand and touched the earth with the tips of his fingers. The earth shook and bore witness to the achievements of Siddhartha in this life and in earlier lifetimes. Mara accepted defeat and left the grove. Calm returned to the grove. The moonlight reflected on the dewdrops on the grass and the air smelt sweet. Siddhartha's mind was calm and it opened to the secrets of the universe. Past lives, future events, the mystery of the planets and stars, the law of birth and death, the cause and effects of our actions and the truth of how to move beyond suffering dawned on Siddhartha. Siddhartha's mind was filled with a radiant light and he was no longer Siddhartha. He had become the Buddha, the enlightened one. For seven days, Siddhartha continued to sit under the Bodhi tree. He meditated on his newfound knowledge. He experienced the happiness of freedom and peace. In the next six weeks, the Buddha continued to assimilate the knowledge sitting at different places close to the Bodhi tree. It is not clear as to when or by whom the first Mahabodhi temple was built. The temple existed in some form when Emperor Ashoka visited the site 250 years after the Buddha's enlightenment. What is known is that Emperor Ashoka built a small shrine. He also placed a highly polished slab of stone with four pillars under the Bodhi tree at the place where the Buddha sat. This seat is called the Vajrasan or the throne of enlightenment. As we enter the Mahabodhi site, we see the pyramid-like structure of the main temple standing on a square base. There are four towers at the corners of the temple. The temple houses a large image of the Buddha in the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra or touching the ground pose. This represents the Buddha calling the earth as a witness to his rights for achieving enlightenment. The statue is said to be 1,700 years old. You find the holy Bodhi tree located behind the main temple. The present tree is the fifth generation descendant of the original Bodhi tree under which the Buddha meditated. Pilgrims sit and meditate, focusing on the tree. They pick up the leaves as they fall and preserve them for worship. There is a stone railing enclosing the site that is said to be over 2,000 years old. Walking around the Mahabodhi temple, we see Animita Chetya is the shrine built at the place where Buddha sat gazing and contemplating on the tree that had sheltered him and had given him protection during his quest for enlightenment. This was the second week after enlightenment. Ratna Chetya. Here, the Buddha materialized the golden bridge and paced 18 steps on it. He walked to and fro on this golden walk, putting to rest any doubts expressed of his enlightenment. This walk is worshipped and decorated with flowers. This was the third week after enlightenment. The fourth week after enlightenment, the Buddha sat in deep meditation at the Ratnagara Chetya. This is an open-air shrine located northwest of the Bodhi tree. The power of his meditation made his body glow. Six colors emanating from within. The colors were blue, yellow, red, white, 
orange and a mixture of all these colors. The colors represent the noble qualities of the Buddha and are today the colors of the Buddhist flag. Still not convinced of his commitment to the path of enlightenment, three beautiful damsels appeared. They danced and tempted him with their seductive movements. The Buddha was not disturbed. After a week, the damsels accepted defeat and vanished. This was the fifth week after enlightenment. During the sixth week after enlightenment, there came a severe storm. The Buddha was lost in deep meditation when the sky darkened and it rained the whole week. But the Buddha did not move. Seeing the Buddha's resolve, a huge cobra coiled himself seven times, covering the Buddha and keeping him warm. The cobra opened his hood above the Buddha's head and protected him from the continuous rain. The seventh and final week after enlightenment found the Buddha at the same place where Sujata had fed him and revived him after his extreme austerities at Pragbodhi. As the Buddha sat and meditated here, he was approached by two merchants. They offered him rice cakes and honey. The Buddha accepted their offering and gave them a few hairs from his head as a gift. The merchants accepted his gift and took it back to their land. These strands of the Buddha's hair can be found enshrined in the famous Shwetaghan Pagoda in Rangoon, Myanmar. Finally, the Buddha was ready to teach. He decided he would first help the five monks he had met at Uruvela. They were now living and practicing austerities at Sarnath, the deer park. The Buddha proceeded to Sarnath. At Sarnath, the Buddha began his long journey as a teacher and a master. The five monks spotted the Buddha enter the park. But as he approached them, they realized that Siddhartha had achieved what they could not. Siddhartha was now the Buddha. They rose up and welcomed him. At the place of this meeting stands a stupa with what appears to be a monument erected on top at a later period. The five monks addressed the Buddha with respect and requested him to teach them the path to enlightenment. During the first night, the Buddha was silent. During the second night, the Buddha made a little conversation and on the third, he began his first discourse. The place is marked by a large stupa. The Buddha assembled the five monks and began speaking. The discourse set into motion the Dhamma Chakka Pavattana or the wheel of the law. He spoke of the middle path the four noble truths concerning the origin of suffering, the cause of suffering, the ending of suffering and the eightfold path that would lead to the ending of all suffering. The five monks became Buddha's first disciples. Sarnath is the origin of the famous Buddhist mantra. Word of the Buddha's presence soon spread. Fifty-four disciples came and sat at the feet of the Master. They listened and they learned. After their initiation, these fifty-four were then sent to spread and teach the words of the Buddha. This was the starting of the Sangha, the Holy Order. At the big stupa, you can see hundreds of pilgrims praying and chanting. Walking around the stupa, softly chanting the Buddhist mantra, the devotees complete their pilgrimage to the site.
the Buddha spent the next rainy season in Sarnath. Buddhism flourished in Sarnath with the support of the local rulers and wealthy merchants. The monastery at the Deer Park flourished and was active for over 1,500 years. This 3rd century monastery you walked through has many structures such as memorial stupas, temples and most importantly the famous Ashoka Pillar. Why has this pillar gained importance? Walk to the nearby ASI Museum and you will see as you enter the highly polished and beautifully preserved lion top. Yes! It is the emblem of India and it came from Sarnath. Siddhartha returned to Rajgir as the Buddha. He lived and meditated at Vulture's Peak for 12 years and composed many important suttas or discourses. This spot where the Buddha sat is now frequented by monks and pilgrims who sit and meditate in their search for the truth. Venuvana, the bamboo grove, became the Buddha's monastery at Rajgir. The grove was donated by King Bimbisara, a devotee of the master. In the Ramayana, we learn that the city of Shravasti was created by Lord Rama for his sons Lava and Kusha. The Shravasti monastery was large and held a special place in the life of the Buddha. The garden for the monastery was acquired for the Buddha by a merchant who paid for it by paving it with golden coins. This monastery must have been special for the Buddha. He spent 25 rainy seasons here. The rooms used by him have been identified and preserved. The Buddha composed and preached 871 suttas while he lived here. At the entrance to the garden is the Ananda Bodhi tree. Ananda, one of the closest disciples of the Buddha, is said to have planted the tree from a sapling taken from the Bodhi tree at Bodhgaya. Ananda is said to have told the Buddha that the disciples could worship and give offerings to the tree when Buddha was away from the monastery. Buddha blessed the tree by sitting under it and meditating a full night. Today, many pilgrims continue to sit under the shade of the tree and meditate to feel the presence of the Master. Further inside the garden, we come across several ancient monasteries, temples and stupas. The most famous of them is the Jetavana Monastery. The Buddha spent years in this monastery. From the writing of the Chinese traveler, we learn that the Jetavana during its heyday housed temples, meditation halls, monks' chambers, bathing places, a hospital, pleasantly shaded tanks, and a well-stocked library with reading rooms. Excavated in 1863 by General Cunningham, the ASI has created a garden that transforms the site to the peace and tranquility that must have characterized the monastery at the time of the Buddha. Gandhakuti or the perfumed chamber and Koshambikuti, the meditation chamber used by the master, are the most important structures unearthed. At many Buddhist sites, you will see this sculpture. It represents the great miracle known as Mahapratiharya or the great illusion. In this miracle, the Buddha divided himself into multiple bodies, thereby creating an illusion in which every person present had his or her own Buddha to converse with. Shravasti is the only site at which the Buddha performed several miracles. He always told his disciples never to indulge in miracles but focus on their search for the truth. 
that Shravasti, the Buddha tamed the famous killer Angulimala, brought sight to the blind, taught the true concept of the Sangha, where compassion and care for each other is paramount, converted his foster mother Gautami as the first nun of the order, and many more important events of his life. When the Buddha travelled to Nalanda, he often stayed in a mango grove. Nalanda was a prosperous and influential town during the Buddha's lifetime. It was here that Sariputra, one of Buddha's close disciples, lived, attained enlightenment and preached. Many years later, Emperor Ashoka built a stupa for Sariputra. The Sariputra Stupa is one of the most imposing structures in the Nalanda site. It is located in the south end of the university complex. The original stupa has been worked upon and strengthened several times. Climbing the stairway to the top of the stupa, we see the Nalanda University complex. The university was built in the 5th century by the rulers of the Gupta dynasty. Facing east, we see nine monasteries each provided with shrine chambers housing a large image of the Buddha. The construction was strong with well plastered walls and monastic cells. A nine storied building accommodated the library. Meticulous copies of books were kept covering all aspects of science, arts and philosophy. With eight separate compounds, ten temples, meditation halls and classrooms, the university was considered an architectural masterpiece. Nalanda was the world's first residential university. It accommodated 2,000 teachers and 10,000 students from Korea, Japan, China, Tibet, Indonesia, Persia and Turkey. Five years after enlightenment, the Buddha visited Vaishali. At this time, Vaishali was a large and bustling city and the capital of the Lichavi kingdom. The reason for the Buddha's visit to this ancient town is an interesting story. Once the Lichavi's kingdom was faced with drought, many of its inhabitants died and disease spread throughout the town. The king of the Lichavi's tribe was a close friend of King Bimbisara, a disciple of the Buddha. The Lichavi's king requested him to persuade the Buddha to visit Vaishali and help the people. When Buddha learned of the request, he agreed and travelled with 500 monks to the city of Vaishali. It is said that as soon as the Buddha laid his foot on the Lichavi's kingdom, rain and thunder showers lashed the land. The drought was over. Buddha then taught Ananda the Ratna Sutta and instructed him to recite the Sutta inside the walls of the city of Vaishali. This rid the people of all disease and brought relief to the land. The Lichavis were very grateful and many of them converted into the Buddhist faith. The site at Vaishali is silent and majestic. The large Ananda Stupa at the center houses the ashes of one of Buddha's closest disciples, Ananda, after he attained Nirvana. This Ashoka pillar stands tall and is the only standing Ashoka pillar today. Across the water tank is Buddha's own monastery and a little beyond the swastika shaped monastery for women. Buddha established the first monastery for women at Kutagara Salavihara, the monastery at Vaishali where Buddha stayed during his visits. The women's monastery is said to have had separate bathing facilities. 
During Buddha's last visit to Vaishali, on his way to Kushinara, the Buddha called Ananda and told him three times that an enlightened soul can extend his life to any length. Ananda did not follow what the Buddha was referring to and kept silent. Finally, the Buddha announced his impending death in three months at Kushinara. Ananda suddenly realized his folly and begged the master to reconsider his decision. The Buddha smiled and said that a decision had been made and it cannot be changed. At Vaishali, the Buddha gave his last discourse and left to Kushinara. As the Buddha left Vaishali on his way to Kushinara, the Lichavi tribe followed him. He tried to dissuade them and ask them to return to their kingdom, but they refused to do so. Finally, the Buddha gave his own begging bowl to the Lichavi king at Kesariya. The Lichavi tribe have built a large stupa at this site. You need to stand on the highway nearby to get a full view of the Kesariya stupa. Measuring 123 meters in diameter, 386 meters in circumference and 46 meters in height, the stupa is composed of six terraces. In each terrace, we see images of the Buddha in different postures. The damaged images are of the Buddha in Padmasana and seated in the Bhumi Sparshamudra with his right hand touching the earth gently. The cells contain life-sized images of the master. Three months later, the Buddha and his disciples reached the town of Kushinara, now known as Kushinagara. Here, he accepted the hospitality of a blacksmith named Chunda and ate his last meal. He then asked Ananda to inform the local mallas of his impending death and requested them to visit him. Soon, the Buddha felt the time had come and went into the garden. He requested for a bed to be made in between two sal trees with his head facing north. He lay down on the bed and addressed his disciples for the last time. He told them the importance of devoting their life to the quest of finding true happiness. With this, he slowly turned to his right, placed his right hand under his head, closed his eyes and peacefully attained Parinirvana. It was a full moon day of the month of Vaisakha and the year was probably between 487 and 483 BC. For six days the body of the master was laid in state. On the seventh day after honoring the body with perfumes and garlands, it was taken to the Mukut Bandhana Chaitya, the sacred shrine of the Mallas. The last ceremony was performed by Maha Kasapa, and the body of the master was cremated with due honor. When the cremation was completed, the ashes were collected by the Mallas as relics. The relics were divided into eight parts and then distributed amongst the representatives of the eight kingdoms which constituted ancient northern India. The relics, along with symbolic offerings, were placed inside eight stupas. Worship of these relic stupas constitutes one of the most important forms of Buddhist practice. Close to his monastery at Vaishali is a relic stupa. After the Buddha attained Parinirvana and was cremated, a portion of his ashes were given to the Lichavi's tribe. 
this relic was housed in the stupa built by them. The relic can be seen at the Patna Museum today. Emperor Ashoka further divided the relics and built 84,000 stupas that are spread across India and many countries of Asia. Some journeys begin with the mind, some begin with the body, and some others when the soul asks us to travel. Walking the footsteps of the master is one where the soul rules the head and the heart, where the sights and sounds of prayer awaken in us the spirit of a prince who renounced all worldly pleasures so that the world may find peace and happiness. Let us begin and go on this journey of the soul, the true purpose of our life.